Are you having trouble designing a track plan for your model railroad? Do you find yourself asking, how do I even start? Well, sometimes all it takes is a little help to get you where you want to be. That was the case for Jason Schoenman, who contacted me about three months ago looking for some help with a track plan. In this video, I'm going to talk about the process I used to help him get the layout plan he was looking for, including tips you can use to do the same. Hi everybody, I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot, where we give model railroaders the knowledge, tools, and services they need to build a realistic layout and the motivation to work on it right now. I enjoy layout design and track planning, which is why I include them on the list of services that I offer. Now, I'm not one of those people that draws track plans all the time just for the sake of it, but when there's an opportunity to design something purposeful for someone, I'm all over it. For some, there's nothing scarier than a blank sheet of paper. That's true of writing, talk to me when it comes time for a new video, and track plans too. New modelers often have lots of ideas and visions in their head, but may not know how to take steps towards getting those ideas to a workable track plan. Jason came to me after watching my second Q&A video. In it, I mentioned my consulting services. He had also seen my videos on the grunge, and they'd gotten him excited about building a shelf layout. His message to me read, I have a 2x10 layout track plan that's half done, and I need help with that last bit. Jason, like many of us, had a 4x8 layout as a child, but about a year ago, during his freshman year at college, something reignited his interest in the hobby. So he went to an OPSIG event, met some people, and over the last year, started to figure out what he wanted in a layout. But the plan wasn't coming together for him. He wrote, I've picked the space and the industries for this proto-freelance, heavy on the freelance layout. I have a local area that I'm using to set the theme and rough industry locations. I have my industries picked. My roster is ready and weathered, and I even have two buildings built. But I can't seem to find a track plan that works for the odd shape and operates well while still being prototypical. We agreed to work together, and I asked him to send me more information on his concept for his layout. Now, when I'm talking with someone about starting a layout, the discussion includes questions about what location they want, what era, what railroad or railroads they want to model, and one other very important thing that many people don't consider, but more on that in a second. When I have these discussions, often people haven't considered some of these basics, but Jason had already gone through the exercise of figuring this out, and the outline he sent me did a really good job of telling me not only what he wanted, but why. The why? can often be the most important and overlooked part. The why helps uncover your motivation for the layout. When you identify the personal reasons behind why you want to build a layout and why you've chosen things like the location, era, railroad, and operating style that you want, the more likely you are to be happy with the layout and the more likely you are to make progress on it. Good layouts tell a story. A story about what they are and why they exist, and by extension, a story about their owners and what they expect to get out of that layout. So along with Jason's outline were two other things. One was a rendering of the space that he had to work with, which was extremely helpful when it came time to draw the track plan, because I didn't have to guess on any of the dimensions. The second was a set of small layout plans that he liked, which gave me insight into the kind of density and operations he was looking for. Now his basic requirements were pretty straightforward. He wanted a layout set in 2019, located in the Bay Area of California, specifically a section of the Oakland-San Leandro area served by the Union Pacific. He had chosen that specific spot because it included industries he liked, and he also liked that they flanked both sides of the main. He chose that era because he told me it was, quote, the last time life seemed normal. Can't really argue with that. To get me oriented, he sent me a Google Maps link, and I gotta tell you, when I went to the map, I could immediately understand why he was drawn to this area. If I was interested in a Union Pacific-themed layout, this would be an area that would be on my short list to explore. It's a huge industrial area that obviously hosted a ton of rail activity at one time. You can tell from the shapes of the buildings and the plots of land that all kinds of industrial spurs used to branch off from the main all over the place. Using this area as a starting point provides a perfect example of a compact urban layout with densely packed industries in every direction. He went on to say that the right-of-way has seen a lot of changes over the years, and currently two of the industries he wanted to model, like many in the area, aren't served by rail anymore, which is pretty obvious from the street view. Despite this, his take on it was... Let's pretend they still are. And that's one of the beautiful things about model railroading. You can modify history to suit your needs. Even so, he was realistic about what he could include, realizing that some compression, freelancing, and artistic license were going to be required. While the prototype had remnants of a double-track mainline, passing sidings, abandoned track, and so on, 
He knew that including all that wasn't really going to be feasible for a layout that was roughly 10 to 12 feet in length. This is the drawing that Jason sent me of his space. He planned to build the layout along one wall, which had an unusual jog and access to a window. The total length was about 12 feet. He had enough space that he'd be able to add a 36 inch fiddle stick for staging on the right side and a 10 to 14 inch stick on the left to make switching easier. Now it's an unusual space for sure, but I was pretty confident we could make it work. Building a layout is hard, and it's easy to let fear and procrastination creep in, with the end result being you never get your layout built. So have you ever wished that you had someone to kick you in the butt and keep you on track? Well, have I got good news for you. I'm starting online mastermind groups, and enrollment for the first early adopter group is now open. A mastermind group is comprised of modelers just like you who want to work together to help everyone in the group meet their modeling goals. This first group will meet via Zoom at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the second Tuesday of each month, starting in February 2023. Each group is limited to only eight people, so don't miss your chance to make your layout goals come true. To join the Mastermind group, visit my Patreon page. The link to the page, as well as to a video explaining Mastermind groups, are in the description below, as well as above if you're watching on a computer or mobile device. From there, you'll see selections which include the additional Mastermind option. Again, I'm limiting this to only eight people so that it doesn't get too large and that the members get the attention that they deserve. This is a great chance to meet other modelers, leverage the advice and experience of the group, and make real progress on your layout. So join now. Jason identified three industries that he wanted on the layout. Lagunitas Brewing, A&J Photo Supply, and Clunkers Engineering. Per Jason's outline, Lagunitas Brewing is an internationally known brewer with its headquarters and one of their breweries located in the modeled area. On the prototype, 21st Amendment Brewing currently occupies that building. And you can see here that the building was obviously once rail served. On the layout, it would be represented by structures from Walther's Magic Pan Bakery Kit. The main structures of this kit are modular enough that they lend themselves to different shapes, so it's easy to change the footprint, which is really nice in this case. It'll receive two to three cars, and since he wanted to model a bigger brewer, he thought it would be cool to add a second track for the grain delivery and use the kit's grain storage elevator. So that means grain hoppers and boxcars for this industry. He wanted it placed near the fascia, if at all possible, and in the main or left portion of the layout. Lagunitas also ships products by truck, so he wanted the room to model as many truck bays as possible. A&J Photo Supply is a fictional photo supply warehouse that pays homage to the love of photography that Jason and his sister share. And you guessed it, her name starts with A. This industry will be represented by the Walther's Buds Trucking Kit. A&J receives boxcars of product that then get distributed by truck. Jason wanted it to have space for two cars on a single track with placement somewhere along the backdrop, which makes perfect sense given that Bud's Trucking is a shallow backdrop structure kit. Now finally, there was Clunkers Engineering, which is a fictional engineering firm specializing in large construction projects or something along those lines. For this one, he wanted it to be in an open area, similar to the lot on the prototype near Teocal Transport. So it would have no structure per se, but it would make use of Rick's products loading ramps like my team track on the grunge. Clunkers would serve two to three cars, 60 foot flat cars and gondolas on one to two tracks. On our call, we talked about other structures that could be put in, and one of those was a modern cold storage building that you could place along the backdrop. Again, to increase the density of structures on the layout that would better represent the area of inspiration, even if they weren't rail served. As you can tell from that list, Jason was careful to choose industries that would be served by a variety of car types. This can be an important operating element, as it can really get boring switching the same type of car all the time. For example, I model 1984 on my layout, so boxcars are the primary car type, but there are enough gondolas, covered hoppers, flat cars, and tanker cars to keep it interesting. Having different car types with specific destination spots on the layout adds operating interest because you can't just drop a car wherever. On top of that, if cars are being held over, the crew has to shuffle those cars around to make sure that empty cars go, new arrivals get spotted in the right space, and those cars that are being held end up back where they're supposed to be when the crew leaves. 
Jason seemed to know what he wanted, and it was obvious that he'd put a lot of thought into the layout design already. So I asked him what the roadblock was in coming up with a good design. His response was essentially that he'd been given a lot of advice from a lot of different people, including some he referred to as rivet counters. His head was spinning a little bit, and he was suffering from analysis paralysis, trying to include everything that everyone had told him, and it made him unsure about his choices. Now, I'm going to talk about the plan in a minute, and it's going to sound like I did most of the plan on my own after the fact. But in reality, Jason and I discussed most of my ideas during our call, which allowed me to verify my assumptions and make sure I had his buy-in before putting anything on paper. It would be more difficult to do this for a larger plan, but given the size of this one, it worked out really well. I got some high-level stuff out of the way first. The plan was in HO scale, and although there weren't going to be major curves, I set the minimum radius at 30 inches. Before I started, I asked if either the magic pan structures or the Bud's trucking structure was already built. And the reason I did that was I needed to know if I had to work around a certain footprint of structure and build that into the plan. At that point, those structures had not been built, so I had free reign. I also asked if he wanted to include a yard, and thankfully, besides the staging stick, he didn't, which really freed things up considerably. When it came to drawing the plan, the first thing I did was put down the basic bench work. Each small square on the drawing represents three inches. I left some room on the drawing for both the 10 to 14 inch switching extension on the left, as well as for the 36 inch fiddle stick on the right. On the plan here, you can also see the short narrow area on the right side. This conforms to a notch in the wall and the window that I mentioned earlier. Even though I confirmed that access to the window wasn't critical, I still think the backdrop here should be left low to provide emergency egress if needed. The next thing I did was lay the track down for the main line and included the two extensions on each side as part of the bench work. Based on our conversations, I knew that it would be a single track main, and I wanted it to be closer to the back of the main portion of the layout to leave as much space as possible for full-size industry structures, specifically Lagunitas Brewing, at the front. However, my placement wasn't arbitrary. I was thinking ahead a little bit and assuming that there could be backdrop industries added here later, so I left enough space along the backdrop of the main section of the layout for a spur and a narrow backdrop structure in a couple of locations. And this brings up a good point. So for an urban layout, it's a good idea to leave space along the backdrop to include those shallow structures or flats, even if you don't plan to have spurs to them, just to make the space feel more fleshed out and dense. Next, I added a runaround, and I made sure to keep at least two feet on each end of the runaround, which should be enough for a locomotive and a couple of cars, assuming a four-axle locomotive. This way, the locomotive can operate comfortably, even without the additional fiddlesticks attached. Now, a runaround is critical for operations on a shelf layout with turnouts facing different directions to allow the locomotive to get around its train and be able to pull and shove cars into the industry spurs for delivery. If possible, the runaround should be long enough to accommodate the longest train within the confines of the runaround itself. And if you can't do this, you may have to get creative with your operating scheme. With the nuts and bolts of basic operation accounted for, it was time to start placing industries. Looking at the bench work and keeping in mind that A&J Photo Supply was to be a backdrop structure, it seemed obvious to me to put it at the upper right in that window nook. This would allow for a nice long run into the industry while leaving space for scenery in front of it and to the left of it. Given all the elevated roadway in the prototype area, that corner would also be a great place for such a scenic element and that would represent things like Interstate 880. Or you could have an open lot full of containers, trailers, or just debris. It also lends itself to a parking lot or more buildings, possibly even diagonally along that left corner. So you got a lot of options here. What I wouldn't do is put more track here. Even on a small layout like this, you want to try and include some breathing room in the scenery to separate your scenes. Given Jason's request to have the brewery near the fascia and include space for truck docks, the front left area seemed the logical place for it. Having built this kit myself in the past, I knew this orientation would allow him to have at least four truck doors on the right side of the main building. The spurs for the brewery come off the front of the runaround, which also leaves enough space to model the abandoned second main line track if he wanted. This makes it feel as if the brewery had been there while the second main line was still active. At this point, I started thinking about roadways and trying to figure out where I might be able to put access roads. On the prototype, no roads crossed the main line at grade, but I thought I could take some liberties with this. Now, I could place something in the middle of the runaround, and that was possible, but seemed unprototypical. A crossing on the left side of the runaround, providing road access to the brewery, would probably be a better option, and more on this later. 
Rounding out the industries that Jason asked for is Clunkers Engineering. He had specifically called out some trackage near Teocal Transport, which is essentially an open lot tucked into a triangular space between the main line and a roadway. So in the interest of breaking out of the all-track parallel to the main mold, I decided to put this spur in at an angle towards the corner. I also thought it was good to put this on the front of the layout for a couple of reasons. One, since it didn't have a formal structure that wasn't going to block access to any industry at the back, the runaround, or any other turnouts on the layout. Second is that it worked nicely there, and well, why mess with a good thing, right? At this point, the track plan was complete as far as what Jason had specifically requested. But it occurred to me that even with its larger footprint, this layout schematic was essentially the same as the grunge. It had more open area and more opportunity for large structures, but from an ops perspective, it was pretty close. And to be honest, this bothered me a little bit. The term one-trick pony came to mind. I could have moved things around for the sake of a different schematic, but I actually really liked how it looked, so I kept it. Later options will break this mold a little bit, so stay tuned. As it stood, I could be sure that the layout would operate well based on my operating experience with the grunge. There are plenty of areas that could be developed with scenery along the backdrop and in the middle of the layout. Track work wasn't over the top, and the number of required turnouts was relatively low, with a total count at this point of six. Given that Jason is a college student on a budget and turnouts aren't cheap, I didn't want to go overboard. I could call this done. But I also couldn't leave well enough alone, given that the area was intended to be a heavy industrial switching area. So I continued with some additions that he could consider later if he wanted to, as well as give him future opportunities when the layout was close to completion or when his budget was a little bigger. Now, I like the idea of a place to be able to stash cars while switching, and I also like the added operational possibilities and variety of a team track. So I decided to put one in over by Clunkers Engineering. I then drew in the roadway, finding a spot where A, it wasn't going to cut across the layout perpendicular to the backdrop, which has been a problem for me on the grunge, and B, it would be clear of the working parts of the turnouts. With the roadway in place and leveraging the open space on the backdrop, I put in another industry at the upper right. As I mentioned, we'd discussed the possibility of a cold storage warehouse, and this could be one. And it would also make sense with the road place there that trucks would be able to access the warehouse too. Similar thought process went into industry number five, but I also liked the fact that the lead to A&J photo was long, so you could deliver to this industry without getting in the way of any cars spotted at A&J. Industry number six went over by clunkers, and it represented one of those industries reached by the long winding leads on the prototype. You could even add structures on both sides of the track to get the concrete canyon effect. This was the plan that I gave to Jason, and I was sure to tell him all the areas that were optional. The feedback I got back was that he really liked the plan, and he said, All I would say is move that extra industry track closer to clunkers so they get two tracks, and it's pretty much perfect. So here's what it would look like with that change in place. One final edit I'd make is that, well, I still like that possibility of a team track or a place to stash cars while switching. So I'd add back another short length, and this then would be my final plan, including all the optional industries and track work. The prototype area would be a great inspiration for anyone who's interested in modeling the Union Pacific in an urban setting with lots of switching and operations. I'll include a link to the map in the description below. The industry options are many and varied. There's a yard north of the area we focused on here that could be used as the hub for operations, and the long straight main line means you have access to the entire North American rail system either north or south of there. There are some other takeaways from this process. Know your why. It informs everything you do. Even modern Class 1 railroads provide opportunities to model intensive switching. You can build your layout in stages as time or funds become available. There's no need to build everything all at once. Even on a small layout like this, you want to try and include some breathing room in the scenery to separate your scenes. A runaround is critical for operations on a shelf layout to allow the locomotive to get around its train and be able to shove cars into the industry spurs for delivery. Operations are enhanced by incorporating a variety of industry and car types. There's a lot of operating potential and fun to be had with a small layout. And finally, it's your layout. Don't let others dictate what it should be. This was a relatively simple plan, so it didn't take long to come together, just a couple of hours. In fact, it took way longer to write the script for this video. But it should provide Jason many hours of enjoyment. There's a lot of activity in an area of about 26 square feet, even smaller than a 4x8. Who says you can't have an interesting layout in a small space? 
Have you designed a layout for a small, odd-shaped space? How successful has it been? I'd love to hear all about it in the comments. That's also the place for questions and suggestions. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Links are in the description below. Facebook is an especially good place to get in touch with me if you are looking for consulting engagements. So that's all for this video, but don't stop here. Are you having trouble getting started on your layout? Click on the link in the upper left to see how you can set goals and kickstart your efforts. You can also find more great content below that. I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll meet me next time in the train room.